Uh, we are very lucky to have our uh, very own Dr. Sumit Mitter here for his grand rounds on cardiac amyloidosis. Dr. Mitter attended medical school at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, um, and then did his residency in internal medicine right here at Mount Sinai, um, and then subsequently completed training in cardiovascular disease as well as advanced heart failure at North Northwestern in New Chicago. Um, we are very lucky, or, sorry, in Chicago. Uh, we are very lucky to have Dr. Mitter um, back here as a heart failure attending. Uh, he's a regular on our heart failure service, um, which uh, has been a great educational boon to us as a residency. Um, Dr. Mitter, his uh, research interests are in advanced heart failure, specifically in advanced imaging uh, for diagnosis and management of infiltrative cardiomyopathies, um, which is very lucky to have him talking about cardiac amyloid today. Um, so please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Sumit Mitter. All right, good morning everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, the title of my talk today is Phenotyping Hefpef, the Case of Cardiac Amyloidosis. Um, I'll start with my disclosures. All right, so our objectives today are to recognize the burden and different causes of heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction, and it'll also discuss novel diagnostics and therapeutics for cardiac amyloidosis. What we'll do is we'll start with some heart failure 101. We'll go back to medical school and we'll talk about calculating the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is actually a volumetric analysis of LV function, and this reflects um, systolic function, where we take the end diastolic volume, subtract the in end systolic volume, essentially our stroke volume, and divide that by the end diastolic volume and multiply it by 100. That gives you your ejection fraction as a percent. The heart failure guidelines from 2013 actually define heart failure and break it up based on the ejection fraction. Heart failure with reduced ejection fractions, often commonly referred to as systolic heart failure, is heart failure with an EF less than or equal to 40 percent. We actually have guideline directed medical therapy that has been efficacious and imp that improves mortality in HEF-REF. HEF-PEF, however, meaning heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, <coughs> is heart failure with an EF greater than or equal to 50 percent. Previously, this is called diastolic heart failure. You know, there's a lot of criteria to decide, define what HEF-PEF actually is. And today, we don't have efficacious therapies that have actually improved mortality. Um, also to note, there is half, um, heart failure with mid-range or borderline ejection fraction with, where their EF is 41 to 49 percent. So why does this matter? We need to understand and recognize all heart failure. According to the NHAID survey between, uh, from 2013 to 2016, there are 6.2 million Americans greater than 20 years of age who have heart failure. And by 2030, this is going to increase to about 8 million adult Americans, which is about 3% of the U.S. population. In terms of costs, in 2012, we spent $31 billion on care of heart failure, two-thirds of which are direct medical costs. And by 2030, this is projected to double to about $70 billion. The prevalence of HEFPEF is actually increasing. So from the Get With the Guidelines heart failure registry of about 110,000 patients with hospitalized heart failure, we know that by about 2014, the prevalence of HEFPEF, preserved ejection fraction heart failure, and HEFREF, reduced ejection fraction heart failure, was about equal. And this was a projection in 2013 that by 2020, or right around the corner, 65% of hospitalized heart failure patients will have an ejection fracture greater than 40 percent. In like untreated heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, HEF-PEF pretends to a very poor survival. At five years, about 35 percent. So then that brings us to what causes HEF-PEF. I already mentioned, you know, it was commonly referred to as diastolic heart failure. So, Presumably, it's from a thick, stiff, non-compliant left ventricle, um, which we're looking to as a conical shape here on the left, that for every given, any given volume, there is a higher um, LV pressure, okay? 
compared to a normal myocardium. The normal LV is the blue line here, and patients with half path are in the solid red line. That rise in LV pressure is exacerbated with exercise at any volume, which is the dotted red line here. But today, half path is actually considered to be a complex syndrome. It re reflects perturbed organ systems, metabolic stress, sedentary life, and aging that lead to ventricular remodeling and stiffening and loss of cardiac reserve. Comorbid obesity, hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease can lead to a systemic inflammatory cascade affecting many organs. And so with respect to the heart, reactive oxygen species um, in the vascular endothelium lead to reduced nitric oxide release. Cardiomyocyte hypertrophy and fibroblast, fibroblast and collagen deposition in the extracellular matrix, and thus that stiffens the heart. <clears throat> Recognizing half path as a cause of dyspnea from non-cardiogenic cause of dyspnea can be difficult, but recently we have scores that help us recognize half path, and this is actually the half path score. And that's kind of going back to the comorbid illnesses that track with half path, such as obesity, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, age, and also echo drive measures of pulmonary hypertension and increased left ventricular pressures. So if we can recognize it, how do we treat it? By and large, most of us shrug. And that's because heart failure, HEFPEF trials have been disappointing. Large trials using agents like ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, mineral recorded receptor antagonists, often used in half ref or reduced ejection heart failure, have been disappointing in terms of reducing um, hard cardiovascular outcomes, mortality, hospitalization. And there could be a number of reasons as to why the trials are disappointing. Were we looking at the wrong outcomes? Patient selection, trial design, Trial oversight, that reflects the TopCat trial. So when asking the question, why is it so hard to treat HEFPEF, maybe we need to go back to the fact that it's actually a heterogeneous syndrome. As a syndrome, HEFPEF has many phenotypes. In this work by my mentor, Sanjeev Shah at Northwestern, um, he, he took a database of 400 patients with HEFPEF. All right, and analyzed with hierarchical cluster analysis to see if they can be delineated into distinct groups. And from that analysis, he found three different phenogroups of half path. They reflect differences in ventricular remodeling. And so in phenogroup one, it's the least cardiac remodeling, the least amount of dysfunction, and the lowest BNP level, or a marker of wall stress. Phenogroup group two in the center actually has more impaired left ventricular relaxation. It also has a higher prevalence of diabetes. Phenogroup group three um, has the most severe electrocardiac remodeling, has more RV dysfunction and renal dysfunction. So these different groups actually have different um, survivals free of cardiovascular hospitalization or death, where phenogroup group one has the best survival, and phenogroup three is the worst. So then we're left with whether half path phenogroups require different therapies. So when asking the question, why is it hard to treat half path, we have to realize the shoe has to fit. We're gonna go back to some more um, uh, basics of left ventricular function. This is gonna be boot camp and diastology. All right, so, these are images of flow across the mitral valve on the left here and on the right uh, tracking the mitral valve annulus, okay? And so in diastole, when there's flow across the mitral valve, that's diastolic filling of the LV, there's an E wave, and that reflects early diastole or passive filling, movement of blood, of blood down a pressure gradient, all right? And so it's very fast. The A wave is in late diastole, it's the active portion of diastole where there's atrial contraction, atrial systole, all right? That's the A wave. And in normal people, the E to A ratio is greater than one, meaning people with normal function, not normal people. So, um, you know, 
Then looking at the mitral valve annulus, this can be mirrored in looking at the speed of mitral valve annulus, okay? Um, the S prime uh, uh, notation here actually means the speed during systole of the annulus. And E prime and A prime mirror early and late diastole movement away from the cardiac apex um, where the echo probe is at the top of the screen in this diagram. So in this diagram, the first row is normal diastolic function. E is greater than A. But in grade one diastolic dysfunction, as, left ventricular, as there's impaired myocardial relaxation, left ventricular pressure rises, okay? So there's less of a pressure gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle. So during diastole, that gush of blood in early diastole doesn't really occur, okay? It's blunted, okay? So we rely more on late diastole with atrial contraction. So that E to A wave is now, that ratio is less than one. It, but to improve emptying of the left atrium, we'd want to slow down the heart rate. We, slow, you know, we improve diastolic filling time, so you unload the left atrium, okay? In worsening diastolic dysfunction, grade three, when the heart is very stiff, non-compliant, there's no stroke volume, all right? Chronic rise in LV pressure from that LV being so stiff causes the left atrium to have very, very high pressures over time and dilate, okay? The left atrium loses its contractile function. So what happens is in early diastole, that pressure in early diastole, diastole is actually greater than the LV pressure. So flow is actually very quick in early diastole, but there's not much flow in late diastole because there's no atrial function, okay? And so because the stroke volume is fixed, if we impair heart rate during this time period, you'll drop your cardiac output. We're dependent on a heart rate for cardiac output in, late, in uh, grade three diastolic dysfunction. So we'll use the case of Ivabrin to demonstrate why this is important in picking therapies for HFPEF. Keeping diastology in mind, we can, what, what we have here is Ivabrin works on funny channels in this SA node, lowering heart rate and prolonging, prolonging diastolic depolarization without affecting inotropy, okay? There's also a lucertrope effect, meaning that Ivabrin improves myocardial relaxation. So we're lowering heart rate, not lowering contractility. <clears throat> so in this study by Kusmala and colleagues, 61 patients with HFPEF were randomly assigned to Ivabrin, five milligrams, twice daily versus placebo for seven days. In short-term treatment, treatment with ivabradine actually improved exercise capacity measured by METS as well as um, oxygen consumption, peak VO2. Um, and this probably reflects improving diastolic filling time and left atrial unloading. But a follow-up study also testing uh, ivabradine, in this case 7.5 milligrams versus placebo Patients in this group of HFPEF actually had worse outcomes when treated with ivabradine. But these patients actually had late diastolic dysfunction, grade three, impaired compliance when they actually needed higher heart rates to maintain cardiac output. So when we're picking therapies for HFPEF, we need to match make it. We need to do matchmaking between the therapy and the pathology. So when we're looking at exercise diastolic dysfunction, um, early HFPEF, these patients may benefit from ivabradine or blockade of the funny channels or exercise training where we're actually lowering heart, heart rate um, to uh, lead to left atrial unloading. But as diastolic dysfunction gets worse and HFPEF worsens and this LV is stiffer, perhaps other therapies like Entresto, Spernalactone, PD5 inhibitors or hemodynamic sensors can help us treat HFPEF. So the therapeutic success depends on making the right diagnosis here. In making the right diagnosis, we have to understand then our tools for HFPEF, are they specific? You know, HFPEF is a heterogeneous syndrome, so all the tools you use are we doing the right thing here? We're looking at diastolic function, just flow across the mitral valve, and how the mitral valve moves to grade diastolic dysfunction. But is this enough? 
Maybe we need to assess the myocardium better. So one of the things we're doing in um, echo labs across the country now is looking at strain. And this reflects looking at a stress-strain relationship of the myocardium. This is a paper from 1973 that looks at the relationship um, where it relies on elasticity, the property of recovery of material from a stress state, where stress is the for force per unit cross-sectional area of a material. And in this relationship, strain is a dimensionless quantity and is produced by the application of a stress. It represents the fractional or percent change from the original or unstressed dimensions. Lagrangian stain is defined as that new length when something is stressed versus the subtracting the original length and dividing it by the original length. And so it offers a pure index of regional LV function, but it can often be difficult to measure. You know, previously when we were looking at LV function, we were looking at volumes of the LV or tracking velocities of tissue. But this is looking at the myocardium of a, at a segmental level. So that brings us to speckle tracking echocardiography. The fibers of the myocardium in the innermost layer, the subendocardium, are a right helix. But as we progress to the subepicardium, there's a left hel uh, helix shape of the myocardium. In the mid wall, these myocardial fibers are circumferential when looking from a long axis view of the, uh, uh, an apical four chamber view of the LV, meaning we see all four chambers of the LV on the echo, LV, RV, RA, LA, all right, and our ultrasound plane is then orthogonal to the circ circumferential fibers in this plane. In actually these, the bright spots is the mid wall. We start tracking this on speckle tracking e um, echocardiography. So what strain does is it takes these small segments and see how they move with time and how the length changes with time. And so for a normal LV, we'll break up the LV into six different segments, all right, in this view, and look at the f length and function over time. And normal strain here is actually an absolute value of 20. Just keep that in mind, all right? For each segment and overall for the LV. When left ventricular function is very impaired, strain is reduced. These myocardial segments, they don't stretch as much, okay? Length doesn't change much, okay? So strain is reduced. And so what happens when we're measuring strain is in these segments, we can create a strain curves, which is the center panel, showing how each segment moves throughout the cardiac cycle. And then we can flatten it into a bullseye plot, which is what we see on the right here, all right? And then breaking down function into small segments, all right? That normal value is 20%. And what we do, this is a color-coded map. Basically, red is good here. That's normal LV strain. All right. If it's white, that would be abnormal. And so presumably, we can have a lot of thick ventricles, okay, in many different diagnoses that might ultimately lead to abnormal strain. Whether it's cardiac amyloid, hypertensive heart disease, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All of these diagnoses are going to lead to increased filling pressures at lower volumes and cause HEFPEF. Traditionally on echo, they may even look the same, whether it's hokum, amyloid, hypertensive heart disease, or a lysosomal storage disease. All of these actually give you that star and sky pattern. But what strain does is, when we look at a segmental analysis of the myocardium, we're breaking down the function into small portions. And where there's a lot of disease, that function's impaired. And we learn a lot about the myocardium that way. In the top row are patients with amyloid, all right? Amyloid fibers deposit in the base, that's the outermost layer of this bullseye plot, and the mid wall of the myocardium, which is the inner ring, um, the, the mid ring, and then the apex is the most inner ring. And so what I mentioned was normal strain is red on this heat map here. White is abnormal strain. So an amyloid, strain is reduced in the base and the mid, but the apex has normal strain. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where the septum is often affected, that's where there's a lot of pathology. 
So that portion, the septum, which we see here in B1 and B2, is the pink portion. That's where the, where the fibers are abnormal, okay? So strain is lost there. And then aortic stenosis leads to LV hypertrophy, and it's kind of patchy in its distribution of how the myocardium is affected. So we can glean a lot from strain to sit there and say, what's actually happening? <coughs> to treat half hef we need to know the underlying cause. So that takes us to the case of cardiac amyloidosis. So amyloid starts as half pef with preserved ejection fraction when it affects the heart. Late stage disease leads to reduced ejection heart failure. We can treat it like hypertrophic, if we treat, if we treat it like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or use medications traditionally used to reduce blood pressure in half pef that can actually be harmful. Beta blockers reduce heart rate and decrease cardiac output given a fixed stroke volume. That's bad for amyloid patients. Using ACE inhibitors or ARBs to lower blood pressure can be actually detrimental because the blood pressure drops quite a bit. Amyloid patients have a lot of autonomic dysfunction in neurohormonal insufficiency, and so their blood pressure will drop a lot. You talk to any amyloid patient and ask them, how do you feel after beta blocker? They say they feel wiped out. They take their ACE inhibitor and they just feel dizzy or lightheaded. We often use these therapies in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but, you know, such as a beta blocker, but that's harmful here. So it's important to understand what our pathology is. <clears throat> amyloid um, can be produced in the, amyloid fibers can be produced from AL or TTR amyloid. So AL amyloidosis is where in a, a clonal cell uh, produces immunoglobulins and light chains dissociate from the immunoglobulin, misfold, and into amyloid fibers. And then that deposits in different organ systems. Transthyretin amyloidosis is actually produced by the liver, all right? It is a tetramer protein in the blood that breaks apart into monomers when it's destabilized and forms amyloid fibrils. These fibers deposit in different organs, all right? And based on if it's AL or TTR, it predicates for different organs. All AL or TTR, wild type or mutant, have, can involve the myocardium, cardiomyopathy. And they all can often be, often be predated by carpal tunnel disease. <clears throat> but AL can also deposit in the kidneys, in the GI tract, whereas age-related transthyretin amyloid also affects the lumbar spine. And mutant TTR is associated with a poly polymotor and sensory neuropathy. It can also affect the GI tract in terms of causing constipation or diarrhea. Gold standard diagnosis is that we have to have pathology, okay? So the amyloid protein deposits um, in the myocardium and on conger red staining, um, there's apple green bipharyngids. This is what we always learned in how to diagnose amyloid. There's a discrepancy between what we see in imaging, hypertrophy of the LV, and the EKG, low voltage. That's what we're traditionally thought. But this isn't necessarily a very specific marker um, or sensitive marker for amyloid. Less than 40% of patients with biopsy-proven disease actually have a low voltage EKG. And often that actually means a marker of advanced disease when it is present. Um, this EKG showing on the left-hand panel low voltage two months prior seemingly was normal. And if we only went by the EKG, we wouldn't have picked up amyloid. <clears throat> Other ways to detect amyloid um, are actually using cardiac MRI. And so we can track, we look at diffuse subendocardial delayed enhancement. And so for you to understand this picture here, what we're doing is we're looking down into a conical LV. That's the ring in the center. And then next to that is a crescent-shaped RV. Um, the dark muscle is actually working muscle. That's good. The white portion on the inner ring of the LV there, that's scar. That's bad. And so it kind of flips the switch on what's good and bad. St. Augustine said light is good and uh, darkness is bad, but on MRI, just flip it, all right? <clears throat> As I mentioned, a lot of our amyloid patients, they actually have carpal tunnel disease that predates cardiomyopathy. 
by many years often. AL amyloidosis is actually a clonal B cell disorder, all right? There's about, the incidence is about eight per million, eight out of a million people per year. 70% are lambda related, where the ratio of the lambda to the capillite chain is about four to one. Untreated median survival is about 13 months. And so the workup involves getting, uh, using electrophoresis, serum, urine, looking at free light chains and immunofixation, and then looking at prognostic markers, NT pro BNP. The light chains are actually directly toxic to the cardiac uh, muscle and leads to a release of NT pro BNP and troponin. We'll need biopsy confirmation to confirm whether amyloid is involved in the heart or other tissues to make a diagnosis and offer treatment. In the differential is MGUS and wild type of hereditary amyloid. And so we treat AL amyloid by barring from multiple myeloma. Therapies such as thalidomide, bortezomib, to target a clonal plasma cell. Transthyretin amyloid, however, is actually caused by the transthyretin protein. It is a pre-albumin, we all produce it. It's 127 amino acid protein that transports T4, thyroxin, and retinal binding protein. So it transports thyretin, thyroxin, retinol. In a normal state, this is a tetramer confirmation. In an abnormal state, the tetramer breaks apart, all right? You'll see that at the bottom here. And these monomers misfold and deposit in the myocardium. That can happen with age, what we previously called senile amyloid, but now we call that wild type, or it can happen early due to a mutation that changes the kinetics of dissociation so the protein destabilizes faster. There's about 120 single point mutations. We actually don't know the true prevalence of cardiac amyloid. On some autopsy series of HEFPEF patients, when they're above 75, about 32% had transthyretin deposition. In patients with HEFPEF who were less than 75 on autopsy, that, there's about 8% with transthyretin deposition but only 20% of the patients with transthyretin deposition had a pre-mortem diagnosis of amyloid. 16% of patients with aortic stenosis undergoing TAVR, or transapical uh, valve replacement, actually have amyloid in their heart. We benefit today using new image, you know, we base, going back to nuclear scanning of the heart, something that is doesn't happen as frequently now, we can actually use different tracers to see if amyloid, if there's uptake in the myocardium. And this affords us the possibility to diagnose transthyretin amyloid without a biopsy. So in negative uptake, there's actually, the heart is not white, it's black. But with the bone tracer, because the amyloid fibrils pick up calcium, um, that actually deposits in the heart and you'll actually see uptake of this bone tracer. When compared to endomyocardial biopsy, this is 100% specific for transthyretin amyloid if there's no detectable monoclonal protein. AL fibers weakly bind um, this bone tracer. So if you have no evidence otherwise of AL disease, this is very good for TTR amyloid and is quickly becoming the standard in terms of diagnosing transthyretin amyloid. What we know about uh, amyloid worldwide for transthyretin amyloid is that in the Americas, all right, it's often a disease of older people, traditionally thought to be of men, and there's actually a higher prevalence among African Americans with a mutation, um, valine 122 isoleucine. And it's predominantly a cardiac phenotype. The rest of the world, there's actually an equal prevalence between men and women. And they can often happen at a, young, happen at a younger age, and the phenotype is such that there's more neuropathy due to different mutations. And so among patients over 80 at autopsy, 25% will actually have wild type transthyretin amyloid. 15% of hospitalized HEFPEF patients with an LV wall thickness greater than 12, 12 millimeters will actually have wild type deposition. And in actually in some series, men and women are equal. So we may be under diagnosing the disease in women. Clues to this diagnosis 
or is that the diagnosis is predated by carpal tunnel disease or lumbar stenosis, hip or knee arthroplasties? And remember, there's not much neuropathy with wild type. But mutant amyloid can actually have varying phenotypes, ranging from neurologic to cardiac or a mixed phenotype depending on the mutation. Here in the United States, the valine 122 isoleucine mutation was actually first discovered by Dr. Gorovic, he's actually in the audience here. Um, and it's in about three to four percent prevalence among African Americans. It's also common in Afro-Caribbeans. And these patients develop heart failure symptoms around age 60. Neuropathy is rarer, but it can occur, and it's predated by carpal tunnel, carpal tunnel disease as well. And remember, these patients can also have a lot of GI issues. So when understanding amyloid, it's important to detect it early, especially among HEFPEF patients, because now we actually have treatments available for it. Remember, about 15% of hospitalized HEFPEF patients have amyloid. So now with treatments, we can actually potentially change the natural history of this disease. Our treatments actually target suppressing the amyloid protein, stabilizing the tetramer, or degrading the fibril once it's already there. And so this concept of TTR stabilization is taking that tetramer when it dissociates into a monomer, stabilizing it with a drug, such as tefamidus, which selectively binds to that thyroid, uh, that thyroxin uh, site on the protein, and preventing it from dissociating and misfolding and depositing in tissues. Tefamidus was tested in a recently published a track trial in the New England Journal um, in 2018, and it looked at ATTR cardiomyopathy, wild type hereditary, in patients who had cardiomyopathy and NYHA class one, two, or three symptoms. They're randomized to um, a two to one to two um, groups based on 80 milligrams of, of tefamidus, 20 milligrams, or placebo. And it actually had a hierarchical endpoint to see if dosing tefamidus can reduce all-cause mortality or cardiovascular hospitalization. Basically, they looked at people who died between the, uh, the two treatment groups, tefamidus, placebo, and then of those who survived, was there a reduction in cardiovascular hospitalizations? And so we know there's about a 30% reduction in patients treated with tefamidus. <clears throat> versus placebo in terms of all-cause mortality. And on subgroup analysis, there's also a 30% reduction in cardiovascular hospitalizations of patients treated with tefamidus. You get more bang for your buck when the drug is dosed early in the disease process, meaning patients who are NYHA class one or two. They have a better survival advantage as opposed to patients treated later in the course of disease when they have more advanced symptoms. That being said, stabilizing that protein and not letting it dissociate into monomers that deposit in the myocardium, that doesn't cure the disease. You'll still have some protein deposition over time. And this is reflected in the fact that even patients treated with tefamidus have a de de decline in functional status, measured by six minute walk tests, versus patients who are on placebo. But what if we could turn off the production of the protein? This was actually tested in two neuropathy trials, all right? The way the silencers work of trans, uh, TTR silencers work is that it's an RNA-based therapy that in, within the cell, it stops translation of RNA to form these tetramers that can destabilize over time. Two drugs are currently on the market, anatyrosin and patisserin. And what we know is from uh, preclinical trials that patisserin can actually silence transthyretin, lowering level, serum levels of the transthyretin protein, uh, and after about three weeks, these levels rise. So this is a dose-finding study trying to see what the optimal dose is to lower transthyretin levels. And at a dose of 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, that level drops. But after three weeks, the level begins to rise again. As I mentioned, this was tested for neuropathy. Um, and this right here is a diagram looking at neuropathy outcomes from the NeuroTTR study and the Apollo study published in the New England Journal this past summer. <clears throat> Turning off productions of mutant transthyretin protein actually improved neuropathy scores. These scores are measured here by the MNIST and the Norfolk Quality of Life Index. 
stuff I don't necessarily understand, but what I can tell you is the higher score is worse, okay? Um, but over time, people treated with these silencers had lower scores, all right? These are the blue lines at the bottom. These were actually studied in an enriched population who had neuropathy and not much cardiomyopathy. But what we can gauge from these neuropathy studies is that turning off production of the transthyretin protein with, say, patisserin may actually lead to improvement in terms of cardiac outcomes. In a sub-study of the neuropathy data, remember these patients clinically did not have much cardiomyopathy, these patients who were actually found actually on biopsy to have myocardial involvement, dosing patisserin led to wall regression, meaning less thickening of the LV. And actually that strain function I talked about earlier was preserved. It didn't worsen over time versus patients who were treated with placebo. In the cardiac substudy also, there was less wall stress over time. Pro-BNP levels were reduced on patients who received a silencer as opposed to placebo. So that brings us to the Mount Sinai Clinical Amyloid Program. We want to approach this at Mount Sinai now that there's therapies, all right, from a multidisciplinary standpoint. Heart failure, genetics, rheumatology, neurology, oncology, imaging and imaging research, as well as hematology oncology. Because it is a multi-system disease, we want to bring people together to discuss patients and offer the best therapeutics possible. So using a clinical workup, we want to come up with a paradigm for amyloid at Mount Sinai that reflects our referral patterns, doing a workup, looking at pro-BNP, troponin, SPEP, UPEP, kind of take and delineate it into AL versus TTR amyloid. We'll use imaging technology, strain echoes, pyrophosphate scanning, PET MRI, and then even in some difficult cases, biopsy to diagnose amyloid. And if it's light chain disease, we got to get them to the myeloma group so they can get treated with chemotherapy, all right? If it's TTR, we need to, we need to find then if it's actually hereditary, if it's mutant disease or wild type. If it's wild type disease, we're going to treat with stabilizers once they come to market. Give me two months. Um, FDA approval needs to come through. But <clears throat> if it's mutant disease, we need to know if there's polyneuropathy because we have those silencer trials, okay, that show that we can dose TTR silencers for patients who have neuropathy. And if they do, we'll treat them. If they don't, we're left with the oral stabilizers. So the reason why we want to approach this in a multidisciplinary standpoint is because we've looked at providers across cardiology and rheumatology, in one year, we had 50 new amyloid referrals. And about two years ago, we couldn't necessarily treat them in a clinical setting, only in trial settings. We're probably not, we're probably underestimating the number of referrals there actually is or how many patients in our system who actually have amyloid. As of last week, we're actually the first academic center in Manhattan to be clinically infusing patisserin for mutant TTR amyloidosis. I want to present some of the research of my colleague Maria Trivieri. This is kind of pathbreaking in terms of looking at amyloid. And so this is actually combining cardiac MRI, which looks at scar patterns, showed you previously, uh, for amyloid. But that doesn't differentiate well between ATTR and AL amyloidosis. And overlaying a PET scan, which actually looks at disease activity, metabolic activity. And in this PET MRI study, looking at sodium fluoride as a tracer, overlaying PET, MRI, uh, PET images over the MRI where there's scar pattern, we actually see that there is increased uptake of sodium fluoride in TTR amyloid. That is not there in AL or, con or, or control patients. So it, what it offers us is an ability to actually differentiate TTR and AL when it's picked up on an MRI. And it may actually provide us a quantitative assessment because it's looking at disease activity. So down the road, based on treatment, we can actually see if there's a response. We don't actually have to look at crude measures like wall thickness. We actually see if there's actually still disease activity in TTR amyloidosis when, say, we turn off the protein or stabilize the protein. Because we have a group of a lot of people interested in amyloid, that also allows us to participate in a number of trials. Just from the cardiomyopathy standpoint, what we're working on at Mount Sinai is actually getting involved in 
T-SRAN for cardiomyopathy specifically, not just a sub-study of neuropathy patients, but a phase three trial for cardiomyopathy, but also looking at novel stabilizers of the amyloid protein to mimic a protective mutation so those fibrils don't dissociate, and also looking at monoclonal antibodies to an epitope on misfolded TTR monomers. So I want to ask now, where are these patients? You know, half path prevalence is increasing, and transthyroidine amyloidosis is probably underdiagnosed. I'm going to po propose to you that a lot of these patients are showing up to medicine and pulmonary clinic, older patients with unexplained dyspnea, exercise tolerance, who may have had prior carpal tunnel surgery. And then if we take a step back and think, hmm, why does my older patient have these symptoms? Hmm, did they actually have back pain or joint pain? Maybe that's a sign of wild type amyloidosis. If they have dizziness, paresthesias, maybe they actually have mutant amyloid. And I think the first pass is actually in these other clinics. The other thing to realize is that African Americans, we know, are underrepresented in clinical trials. And they often receive less upfront care. But in treating amyloid, we have an opportunity to address disparities. Mount Sinai is a large health system with a lot of referrals, all right? And we can fill in that gap in care. Three to four percent of African Americans um, have this mutation that leads to cardiac amyloidosis. That's 1.5 million people in the U.S. And so what we can now, through genetic screening, offer precision medicine and health equity. And we have those capabilities at Mount Sinai based on our multidisciplinary team that draws on genetics to help nail down the diagnosis and offer a treatment pathway. So take home points for you is that HEFPEF is a heterogeneous syndrome. Successfully treating HEFPEF involves determining the underlying cause. And in terms of cardiomyopathy, we underdiagnose it. There's a common mutation in African Americans. 15% of hospitalized HEFPEF patients is actually due to amyloidosis. And then we have treatments available now for transthyretin amyloidosis. Tefamidus improves survival, and it prevents a decline in functional status, especially when given early. And early detection of amyloid is important because it offers us also an ability to detect it in families and potentially treat early. We're going to get more bang for our buck. So at this point, I just want to acknowledge my mentors who got me to this position to be able to talk about something I'm really interested in, half path and amyloid. Um, and it's across different institutions from different stages of my training. And I also want to thank the people I work with every single day who support me and make it such a great working environment, the advanced heart failure team, um, not just the attendings and the surgeons and the fellows, but actually are my nurse practitioners who make my life so easy by, frankly, catching on the labs I may miss sometimes, um, and also the administrative support, transplant coordinators, our LVAC coordinators, and also our social workers. Thank you. setting on the link between the brain and the heart with amyloid and DNP being two easy examples of such a link? And there's a lot of research out there that's trying to actually associate transthyroid amyloidosis, age really senile amyloidosis, and actually amyloid deposition within the heart. You know, with looking at Alzheimer's disease, there's actually misfolded proteins again. And we're trying to understand if there's a link there. That hard link hasn't been shown, but there are associations between age-related cardiomyopathy, transthyretin cardiomyopathy, and also potentially uh, Alzheimer's. I don't, I don't know the hard link, though. So you showed that the uh, anti-sense therapy against transthyretin only reduces the protein for like three weeks, Yes. Right? Um, and usually we don't see that kind of escape with other siRNA uh, therapies or anti-sense therapies. So first question is, why is that? 
And second, uh, why do you think is that three-week decrease in flex iron protein sufficient to cause an improvement of polyneuropathy for up to a year? So the way the medication is actually dosed is it's weight-based and you actually dose it every three weeks. So in the dose-finding study, because it's the level is suppressed for three weeks, the patient has to come back for another infusion. We start infusing at Mount Sinai, and the goal is to actually bring our patients back at least for three infusions um, over a span of nine weeks, and then we can transition to home infusions using a home infusion company. And that actually leads to sustained reduction in TTR levels. Because the TTR protein actually binds vitamin A, these patients will actually have to uh, simply get vitamin A supplementation because they won't necessarily be carrying as much in their blood. So you mentioned that you would like to get the patients early, and presumably that means even before they have heart failure. You gave some clues as to things that could be associated, such as carpal tunnel, back pain or joint pain in the elderly, but these are very common things. Yes. So I don't understand, because you did, maybe I missed it, I don't understand what is the incidence of cardiac amyloid in patients with those other problems. So is it cost effective to send all the patients with carpal tunnel, for instance, to you to have your studies? That's actually a very, that's a great question. And because we, because we don't know the true prevalence of cardiac amyloid, um, especially uh, in the general population, you know, we have a chance to actually understand how much is out there. And so patients who may present with lumbar stenosis or carpal tunnel disease, um, those patients often have a higher prevalence of, of age-related amyloidosis. It's basically, we want patients who have that, you have to use clinical judgment, raise the index of suspicion. Maybe something else is going on here, but you can actually start with the first pass, sending off some labs, pro BNP, is there wall stress? Or sending for imaging studies that may not actually, that aren't that expensive to see, to detect amyloid early. And then, based on their, it, really going into the minutia of their symptoms to see actually maybe they do have heart failure symptoms. Maybe they really are fatigued. So in terms of cost-effective analysis, I'm not saying everyone should go get a cardiac biopsy to diagnose amyloid, but I do think we need to be, have a higher index of suspicion to see if it's there, send off serologic testing, and then do some imaging to find out if it's there. Patients with carpal tunnel syndrome when they get pathology done, is it usually screened for amyloid? It's not. So I, even just yesterday, I had a patient who had a carpal tunnel release, and we're actually going to hospital special surgery to basically find out was there actually amyloid on that patient, because the patient, as referred to me by Dr. Gorovic, had neuropathy symptoms and uh, carpal tunnel release. And we had to go back to the path lab, was, was there amyloid there? Here that we have is looking at subsets. So uh, we and other centers are beginning to look at carpal tunnel release information on African Americans, and then go back and take a look and see whether we can uncover early heart disease. It's not only our idea. There are groups in England and in Boston that are doing the same thing. Yeah, as a follow-up uh, along that line of questioning, uh, you didn't discuss fat pad biopsies as a, their accuracy or their relationship to any of these general symptoms you discussed. I purposely left that, left that out because it's actually not that great of a test. And, you know, if I even speak to some mycology, hematology, oncology, they, a lot of them have moved away from using fat pad biopsies to diagnose amyloid. Every now and then it picks it up, but even a, given a clinical uh, situation where I think there is amyloidosis, AL amyloidosis, and the fat pad's negative, I'm actually often looking for another tissue to biopsy to find it. So when it's negative, that doesn't mean it's not there. And I think a lot of oncologists have gone that way. <coughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker.